just set the scene, really. So one group of people that I think are really important in the conversations that we've been having that we haven't perhaps mentioned so much are, of course, our plant breeders who produce the crops and are going to have to produce the improved crops that we're going to need in the future. And plant breeders have done an absolutely fantastic job over hundreds of years. I mean, if you just look at the, um, the slide here, you know, they've bred the incredible range of brassica crops that we have today, that we enjoy our cabbages, cauliflowers, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, all the rest of them, from something resembling a wild cabbage, which you see on the left. Now, that's, that's quite an achievement. And that achievement is possible because breeders have had access to variations. So they've had access to small changes in the DNA that's enabled them to select things like, you know, the, the pigment that you, the colors you want, or the flower shape. Um, so that's all fine. Um, I just... Oh, I've got a slide problem. No, it's not going forward at the moment. Next. Yeah, OK, we're there now. OK. So, um, so the way this has been done usually is by finding the variation that's needed in a closely related species and crossing the two together. So let's, in a very simple way, we've got two plants, the red one and the blue one. We want to transfer. The blue one has got almost everything we need, except for that one, I don't know if you can see it, small yellow spot, which we'll think is a particular piece of DNA, a particular gene. We want to transfer it over. So we cross them together, and it's like shuffling two stacks of cards. You end up with a complete mixture, which you see in the next panel. And then the breeders have got to sort that out by a process of back-crossing. So they've got to keep crossing back to the blue parent. And eventually, you end up with something which is pretty much what you want. It's mainly blue. And there's your little yellow one that you really wanted. But it's got this obstinate red bit stuck to it uh, that can't be separated. And that can be a problem. Um, and it also takes a long time. So breeders have traditionally they've looked at different ways. of If they can't find the variation that they need, they look for different ways to actually induce the variation. And in the past, that's been one example of a process called mutation breeding where the breed, this originated like back in the 1940s, where breeders would take seeds or treat it with chemicals or radiation to deliberately make changes in the DNA. And then some of those, a lot of those changes are things you don't want, and some of them are things you do want. And again, those changes will be scattered right throughout the DNA of the plant. So jumping forward, um, of course then we've got genetic modification. Um, so this would enable us to take the gene directly, that yellow blob, and put it directly into the blue background. Now, and that's fine. This is a valuable technique for some purposes. Um, but just to point out, so there's, there are certain things that this technique can do and some things it can't do. So if you're wanting to introduce new genes, then fantastic. Um, they will end up in a random location in the plant genome. So we're not controlling where it, go it goes, which is not usually a problem. It just means you may have to do a bit more work to get what you want. But now we come on to, we've got a new technology. This is the one that we get really excited about. We now have <coughs> genome editing. So now, instead of having to use you know, these processes that I've already talked about, we have the option of going directly into the plant that we want to work with, the blue background, finding the gene that we want to change, and making that gene, making that change directly in the gene. Now, that change might be something very small. So if we imagine my blue square there is a wheat plant, I know it looks nothing like it, but if it was a wheat plant, then if we wrote out the genetic code of a wheat plant, wheat has a massive we call genome, so all the DNA in a wheat plant, it's, it's huge. So I'll be writing out something like 16 billion letters of code. Genome editing will allow us to go in and change just one of those if we wanted to. That's quite incredible. So, okay, so, so what is the technique that I'm talking about? Well, it's CRISPR. You may have heard of CRISPR. You may have heard about it in you know, relation to medical applications because there's some very exciting medical applications of this technique. I'm not going to talk about the science, but you can think of it as a pair of molecular scissors, if you like. So the Cas9 part of it, the blue blob, is like a pair of molecular scissors. It's actually an enzyme. It will cut the DNA. And that enzyme is guided to precisely the right place by a guide RNA. So it's a very simple system. And that's one of it's simple but powerful. And it's been described as a game changer. It's revolutionary, like the, the, the biggest science story of the decade. All these things, you know, the next food revolution even. You know, you can find all these descriptions of this technology. So let me just give you one example, what it looks like. So this is um, oilseed rape. Now, 
So oil seed rape, um, the pods need to open to release the seed. Um, you can see the pod at the bottom is closed, the one at the top is completely open, the seeds are shedding. If this happens too soon, the seeds end up on the ground rather than the farmer being able to harvest them. So this is actually... <laughs> it's great to have a musical accompaniment here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so basically we want those two halves of the pod to stay closed for longer and we don't want to lose the seed. And we can do, we've done that with genome editing. So if you think, this is actually a section, if you think of those two parts of the pod coming together at the top of that picture, um, you can see there's a groove in the, what I've called the wild type, which is the unmodified one, and that's where it's going to open. And if you look at the edited one, it's completely different. That groove is not there. So that one is, is going to stay shut for longer. And if you just look at the sequence of letters at the bottom, this is actually the DNA of the relevant region, and you will see that the change that's been made there is, I think, there's a C that's changed to a T, and there's one G that's missing. That is all, and that's given us that, that change in the crop. So that's just an example of what a genome editing change looks like and what, what it can do. Now, um, that's just one example. There are quite a lot of examples now in the literature of things that you can do with this technology. Um, I've listed some of them here. I'm not actually going to go through them all. Um, various things, you know, for improving nutritional quality. Some interesting recent ones on actually opportunities for influencing yield. Um, disease resistance, another important one. And right at the bottom there, I've put drought tolerance because this is one that I'm particularly interested in. Um, now, I know that we have, we've been talking a lot about flooding, and I know in the current... I'm actually a farmer as well as a scientist, and so I do understand that this. But um, we're going to the other end of the, the other extreme, looking at drought. So these are some barley plants. These were grown in a field trial in Jordan under extremely dry conditions. And what you can see here is a control and two GM lines. And you can probably see those GM lines are looking a lot better. So that was GM, but we can now do something very similar with genome editing. And we can actually be even more precise about the types of changes that we're making to these plants. And we've done this recently in wheat and barley, and now we're, we're analyzing the results. So this is a, it's a powerful technology. Um, there was, I actually picked this up somewhere, there was an article just, I think, four days ago in the Times, um, showing growing excitement about self-fertilizing crops. So this is a picture of some crops grown in Cambridge. Um, it's barley. And these, again, uh, most of these plants are gene edited. And the reason I put this in is because gene editing is also an incredibly valuable research tool. It's the way we use it. And so these plants are telling us which genes might be important in a, process, a long and complicated process of trying to engineer cereals so they can fix their own nitrogen. And you can imagine that that is going to be a real game changer if we are actually successful in doing that. So I pop that one in just to emphasize that um, the possibilities in using it as a research tool is to us is equally as important as what products we might be able to get from it. Okay, so my final message is basically that this, I think genome editing technology are really poised to make a major contribution. Now, I'm not standing here and saying this is going to solve all the problems. No way. It's just one small thing. But it's a very powerful small thing. And I think this is just the beginning of this technology and seeing what it can do. And this is actually a picture of our first gene-edited brassica in a field trial in Norwich this year. And you can see we're starting very small. Wendy, thanks very much. Thank so we're running right out of time, but just, just briefly, um, how far is this from prime time then? How far uh, away are you from? So, the, well, the first crops are already um, being commercialised. Um, uh, first one's already in the field. So, um, you know, this technology is already being used. Um, and, you know, some of the things I mentioned are not there yet, but they're, they're in, the, in the pipeline. Great. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we're probably going to have to wrap up, but please do thank Wendy thank for her time.